Welcome to Church Online. My name is Scott, and this is week one of our new series, Mind Games. If you're here for the first time, I want to say a huge welcome, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. One of my favorite ways to connect with God is in a time of worship. So let's head inside, turn the lights down, turn the volume up, and join the worship team. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cape Christian. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing some songs together today. All right, come on, let's clap those hands. All right, sing this with us. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. 
Thanks, worship team. And I hope that all of you online had fun singing along with us and had an opportunity to really disconnect from the stress of life and connect to God. Now, if you're watching this from our Facebook or YouTube, we would love to invite you to the full church online experience where you can engage with our online community, share in the experience, and grow together. You can go to live.capechristian.com to create an account and find the next live event. Also, make sure to sign up or sign into the chat. There are hundreds of people each week that log in from all over the world, and the best place to connect with them is right there in the chat. So let us know how your week was and make a new online friend. Another great way to engage is to join a private chat and let us know how we can pray with you. Each week, we want you to know that no matter where you're watching from or what you may be facing, you're not facing it alone. And if you need someone to pray with you or just to talk, please click that live prayer link and one of our hosts will gladly join you in a private prayer chat. If this is your first time joining us for Church Online, I'd like to say welcome. We are so glad that you're here. In fact, we would love the opportunity to get to know you. So right now in the chat window, we just posted a connect link just for you. Now, if you click that link, you'll be given a digital connect card to fill out and send our way. In return, we're gonna send you some information about Cape Christian and Church Online. Thank you so much for checking us out and I really look forward to meeting you. Now, for those of us that call Cape Christian home, this is the time you can give your tithes and offerings. And if you've never given through Cape Christian, it's easy to do. Go ahead and click the give link that's at the top of the page or the link in the chat window. From there, you'll be able to create an account on our secure giving platform and start giving through Cape Christian today. And remember, you can always select the church online platform in the drop down menu and continue to grow this church around the world. Today, Pastor Corey is going to launch our new series, Mind Games. So let's head back inside and see what this series is all about. What's going on, Cape Christian? How are you guys doing today? Good to have you. So good to be with you in the house of God. And thank you to everybody joining us online as well from wherever you're at around the globe. If you've never joined the chat online, this is your chance. Join it. Chime in. Let us know where you're joining us from. You're a part of about three to 500 people that, that call Cape Christian Home somewhere else. And so we have hosts online for you as well as a prayer team. So we're excited to do that because wherever you're at, we want to make sure we got you, right? Look at your neighbor and say, I got you. I got you. Everybody wants to be someone where we got you. Well, hey, uh, maybe you weren't here last week, uh, but if, if you weren't, I just want to recap real quick. I, I kicked off kind of the year with, with a word that I felt like God had for us that we're going to continue to come back to uh, week after week, month after month, because I really think it's something that we can latch on to. But I, I made this statement last week, and if you weren't here, you're hearing it for the first time. If you were here, it's been a week and you could have maybe forgotten. And, and I believe that God is saying to us this year that this will be your best year ever if it's your best year spiritually. That I believe that God has some great things in store. In fact, I'm really, I can't tell you the amount of anticipation I have for what God is doing in us and through us, but it's, it's going to require us prioritizing our spiritual life, our spiritual journey. And, and the word uh, that I feel like God has for us as a church, which, which means I believe he has for you as an individual, even if you're just here visiting or here for a couple of months, I really believe you're meant to hear this, that the word that God wants you to latch onto is this word grow, that word grow. And, 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 and I believe that's what he's up to. And regardless of our kind of environment, we have the ability to grow uh, with the things that we go through, whether they're good, they can make us grow. If they're, they're tough, they can make us grow. In fact, in my life, most of the growth that I've shown have come through some of the toughest seasons. Uh, but I had to make the decision to get better, not bitter, amen? Uh, and so I believe that that is what we have. And so we talked about how is this gonna happen? And so last week I just talked about that the thing that will influence you spiritually the most this year is not listening to me for 35 minutes a week, but it's you getting in the scriptures yourself and digging your own wells, letting God speak to you. We walk through that plan. Um, we're gonna launch our 21 days of prayer with a focus on the word this Tuesday, starting on the 11th. We have, you should have gotten those booklets when you came in, but, but that word grow has those two aspects deep. I believe God wants to deepen our character, uh, our, our integrity, our walk, with him and also wide. He wants to widen our, our capacity, our influence, maybe use you in a way you've never been used before. And, and really we talked last week that you are what you read. And last week was, was really a segue into this series, also a segue into the entire year. Um, but something I didn't say last week, but I would say to you this week is that why am I such a big deal on the Bible? Another thing would be that the scriptures is a book that has the best information available on the most important topics. Like we are, uh, the books is a multi-billion, writing and selling books is a multi-billion dollar industry about self-help books and this and business and finance and parenting and you name it, marriages. But the Bible is like the book that has the best information 
on the most important topics and it's right there. And so this year, I believe if we will prioritize that 10 or 15 minutes and do the reading that we talked about last week, um, that you're gonna see significant growth and transformation in your life. And if you missed it, good news, we have a YouTube channel, Facebook, uh, an app, a website, you can catch it all right there. Now we're gonna jump into our series. Uh, we're gonna start a four week series this week. Uh, and and, and I, before I give it away, I just wanna ask a question. Anybody ever travel, probably before the internet, anybody ever travel on a trip or, or take a trip where you planned to go somewhere, but where you ended up was not exactly where you planned to go? Anybody ever have those moments? Yes, some of us. Uh, I remember, um, now, okay, now, yeah, now we're all acknowledging that. Yeah, I remember um, when I was, uh, this was probably 2006 or 2007. So here's what you need to know about 2006 or 2007. We didn't have smartphones yet. We were still T9 texting. The iPhone was originated in 2007. We didn't have Siri. We didn't have GPS. Um, we had this thing called MapQuest. And if you're under the age of 35, what MapQuest was, was you would go on the internet. We did have the internet and you had to type the address or location of where you were going. And then your printer would print out like pages and pages of turn here, turn here. And the further you went, like the more directions, I mean, literally from your house. And so I sent, my, I sent 35 college students, my leadership school from Omaha, Nebraska, 1600 miles to Los Angeles, California. Many of them had not been before, and some of you are already laughing. I haven't even got to the funny part yet. <laughs> Just a picture of 35 college students. Now, fortunately, we had gotten to the point where I had some staff, and they were capable, and I trusted them. And this was one of the first uh, missions trips or big trips that I didn't go on because uh, I had some pretty capable staff, and they were going to go do some amazing work at the Dream Center in Los Angeles and did. And so uh, now we had cell phones so we could check in. So they got there. Honestly, they got from Omaha to Los Angeles, no problem. The week went great. And then on the way back, one of the things we always told our students is, man, we want to give you some new experiences because these were just college students, and we were opening their eyes. Well, if you, if you to the world, and so if you map from Los Angeles, to Omaha, you get real close to this giant hole called the Grand Canyon. And most of them had never seen it. And so the staff's like, PC, do you care if we go to the Grand Canyon? I'm like, listen, I'm gonna go to bed tonight. You guys are gonna be home tomorrow. Whatever you wanna do, you gotta do. Like, you just know where to get, you know? And so like, okay, we're gonna do it. So there were three staff members on the trip. Well, we had two female staff members, both of which just happened to be pastors on this staff that I brought with me, uh, who were like, hey, we should take this trip this, this way that we know, because we all had the backup Rand McNally Atlas underneath the seat, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We had that, uh, and, and, but we, I had this one staff member, a, a male, a little bit stubborn. Uh, in fact, uh, part of his, he had two problems. The first problem was he thought he was the smartest guy in almost every room he was in. His other problem was he actually was the smartest guy in almost every room he was in, but that really chinked the, kind of his armor of his humility. So good news is he's now a very successful doctor helping a lot of people, and he's putting that knowledge to good use. But when he was 22, he had some things to learn. And so he leveraged his I'm always right to convince them that he knew a faster, better way with this kind of other entrance to the, the Grand Canyon. And so 30 college students in multiple vehicles are traveling, winding through back roads. Again, no GPS, no maps, it's, it, all back roads and a couple hours out of the way, only to get a few hundred yards from the Grand Canyon. And now where there was a road, there's a fence and it says former entrance to the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and you can imagine how upset the team and specifically the staff were. And now all of a sudden it's like midnight. I'm like telling two female staff members they can't actually murder a male staff member. Um, uh, and the, the, it had been a long week. And so where they hoped to go, they were this close to getting there, but they didn't actually ever get to see it. They were now hours out of the way. They had to drive through the night and boy, were they not happy when I saw them when they got back into Omaha. Because sometimes when you take a trip somewhere, where you hope to go isn't always where you end up. Now, for, now fortunately, we have GPS nowadays, and some, some of you, you still have a real hard time. I don't know how anybody gets really lost. Although in Cape Coral, like, if you don't use your GPS to go anywhere, like, you're going to hit a canal at some point. Uh, we know that. But, uh, but I thought, what a great metaphor for life. What a great picture of how our lives really are. Because I don't know if you've ever recognized it or not, but let me tell you something that's true for every single one of us listening, is that your life, my life, our lives, are always moving in the directions of our strongest thoughts. Your thoughts are literally dictating the GPS of your life. We're gonna do a four week series called Mind Games. And we're gonna talk about how I believe if this is gonna be your best year ever spiritually, your best year is gonna be spiritually, it's gonna require you getting in the word, but probably what's gonna have to start with some of us is we're gonna have to start to think about what we think about. We're gonna have to start paying attention what goes on up in here because 
whether you've thought about it, maybe you don't, and, and I'm going to hopefully convince you in the next uh, maybe 20 minutes or so, is that what we think actually shapes who we are on so many more deeper levels than most of us have really ever contemplated or given credence to. In fact, the author of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, the Bible says it this way. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Or as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Another version basically says, as a man thinks in his heart, so does he become. And we're literally going to break this down and add some stuff to it over the next four weeks. But this idea, the Bible tells us, the, the living word of God that speaks to us all the time says that the, the deepest, strongest thoughts that are here, that are getting into here, are literally the GPS to my life. They are the ones that determine, do I get to see the Grand Canyon or do I end up on some windy back road? Because I listened to somebody who was sure they were right, but it turns out they weren't. It was wrong. And it had a negative impact and a negative effect. And for some of us, we can laugh about some college kids not getting to see the Grand Canyon, although they're like, you guys are like 36 now. I'm like, we still haven't seen it. I'm like, oh, well, that's, I didn't know it was like that. I'm like, we'll go sometime or something. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a lot more serious when those thoughts dictate problems in relationships, continual financial hardships, or a cycle where you continue year after year or trauma after trauma to go, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. Doctor's visit after doctor's visit. We're like, you got to get your A1C down or whatever it is. We got to eat healthier. Pick one. And we're like, I'm motivated for a minute. I try harder with better actions. I want a better experience, but I keep coming back. We get in these cycles. Why? The cycles aren't because we can't find an experience. They aren't because we can't do better actions. It starts in our minds. I think many of us are going, man, we're looking for a better experience in some realm. And so the good news is what I, what I have to, to say to you is good news. If you want a better experience financially, relationally, spiritually, whatever it is, there's a path to it. God's going to help you and he's going to transform your life. But I'm going to tell you, it doesn't start by chasing an experience because our actions are actually a direct result of our thoughts whether they're conscious thoughts, subconscious thoughts, what is happening here is absolutely, absolutely dictating how you go through life. And so uh, here's my question for you right now as we just begin this kind of whole series, something for you to really ponder, maybe pray about, start journaling about. If you were to stop and pull back for a second, where are your thoughts taking you in this season of your life? Are they taking you towards that you love yourself the way God loves you? Are your thoughts taking you to where everybody has the same value and you're going to treat other people with love and respect and dignity? Are your thoughts taking you towards generosity and looking, towards other, to looking out for the good of other people? Are your thoughts taking you towards being a team player at work? Are your thoughts taking you towards, I'm so dearly loved, I don't need really anything from anybody else, so I'm just going to be a, a giver of love? Or are your thoughts taking you more towards, I hate myself, everybody that told me I was never going to be anything growing up was right, I'm never going to be anything, uh, you know, relationships are never going to work, I keep getting dumped, no one's ever going to really love me for who I am, I have too much baggage. This, where are your thoughts taking you? Have you thought about it? Because for some of us, the, the huge win, if we could just stop the, the pace for a minute, is if we could just think about what we think about for a minute. That's where the battle's gonna start for some of us. Just to think about what we think about. And so, here's the good news. If you want to have different experiences, if you want to have different outcomes, then it has to start by changing your thinking. If you want to change your life, you have to change your thinking. I wanna show you this beautiful progression when Paul was writing to the, the church. Paul was the apostle who was teaching early Christians how to follow Jesus and apply his word. Uh, he wrote a, a, a letter to this church called Philippi and it's called Philippians. And he says this in Philippians 4, verse 8, 9. And this is loaded, but I just wanna draw a really simple uh, uh, something from this. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, he goes, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, uh, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. He just lists a bunch of stuff. He's like, if all these good things, if anything's good, he says, think. Somebody say think. Think about such things. He's saying, I want you to pay attention to what your mind thinks about. You may not be in charge of what comes in, but you do get to pick what stays and what goes and what you continue to, what movie you play back. So he says, I want you to think about these things. So here's that word think. And then he goes on and he says, verse nine, it says, for whatever you have learned or whatever you have received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Somebody say practice. I love this. And he says, and then the God of peace will be with you. Somebody say peace. peace. 
So from these sentences, I want you to see there's a progression that an ancient book 2,000 years ago lays out that I'm going to show you in a second that modern psychology once again has just agreed with. He says, I'm going to give you a list of things I want you to think about. Pure, noble, lovely. Notice he doesn't say hateful, vengeful, divisive, critical. He doesn't say any of those things. He's like, noble, true, love me, admirable, praiseworthy, all those things. He said, I want you to start by paying attention to what you think. And then he goes, and if you do that, then once you've thought about it, I want you to actually put them into practice. And then if you actually put them into practice, what's going to happen is you're going to actually see peace is going to start to be with you. And so Paul moves us through from three things. He says it starts, first of all, with the thought. He's going to move us from start with your thought. He says, think about these things. And he says, once we start paying attention to our thought, that's going to then lead to our actions. The second thing he says, after you've thought about it, he says, put it into practice. And then he says, and if you, if you start with your thoughts and then you actually start focusing on your actions and move in that order, what's going to happen is you're going to move to what we all ultimately want, which is experience. He says, and then if you think about those things and then you put them into practice, here's what's going to happen. The God of peace is going to be with you. Isn't that what we want? Peace, hope, purpose, joy. We're all kind of looking on the macro level for the same things. And now here's what's fascinating about this. It's like, well, yeah, but how do we know that's right? Good, fair question. In recent years, an entire discipline of modern psychology has developed that has been called, uh, become known as cognitive behavioral therapy. Have you heard of this, some of you? Cognitive behavioral therapy, it's a common practice. Uh, and this breakthrough tech, uh, teaching reveals that many of our problems, if not all, are rooted in faulty and negative patterns of thinking. Cognitive behavior therapy does not focus on the behavior, the action, whether it's abuse, whether it's alcoholism, whether it's whatever destructive behavior or habit it is, it knows there's something growing underneath the surface that's at the root of it. And cognitive behavior therapy agrees with what Paul said 2000 years ago, says, if you wanna to get to the root of this, we can't focus on the experience and we can't even look at the actions. We have to start with negative and faulty thinking. Now, I don't know about you, but if the Bible and modern science are teaching us that our lives are moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts, then I, I'm gonna be pretty inclined to listen to what both of them have to say. Then I also think that we have to ask a really important question. Do I like the direction my thoughts are taking me? Do I like where my thoughts are taking me? Because your thoughts are dictating your actions, your actions are dictating your experiences. You want new experiences, you get different Thoughts, according to Bible, according to cognitive behavioral therapy, according to a lot of other. So why does that matter? Because our perception, you ever heard this, is our reality. Reality is <laughs> more than ever. Reality is not very many people's reality anymore, is it? <laughs> we get all kinds of fun with that concept. Reality isn't really reality. Our perception of what's real is really our reality. There's a, a story um, a pastor told, and he talked about how they, were, they used to play a game when they first started their church up, and it was kind of this tag, capture the flag, and they would hide out and jump each other, and they'd have to trade stuff back and forth. Well, the lead pastor walked in, and he had a suspicion that one of his staff members were in a closet hiding. He just, his spidey senses were going off. And, uh, and, and so he walked up the closet, and right when he did, the guy jumped out, and he put his foot in front of the door and slammed it and shut him in. He's like, ha-ha, gotcha. He's like, I'm not letting you out. He's like, I want you to know I'm the boss. I'm the king. I'm better at this game than you are. You are going to be locked in this closet all day. He's like, come on, man. You got to let me out. You got to let me like, no, I pounded and pounded. And he's like, no, man. He goes, I'm going to put a chair in here. I'm going to lock you in. And the guy's like, come on, man. You got to let me out. He's like, no, you are going to learn that you don't mess with the, dog, the big dog. You're here all day long. I'll pay you. You're here all day long. So he, and as he's doing this, he has his foot in front of the door. But what he doesn't realize is the chair that he needs is a long ways away. And this, <laughs> and this guy is just boom, boom, boom. He's resisting for a while. Like, let me out. Come on, let me out. Come on, let me out. You can't do this. He's like, oh, I can. And he's like, man, what am I going to do? And, 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 and after a little while, the resistance stopped. And he's like, now's my chance. He's like, all right. He goes, I think he might have given up. He goes, well, there's no way for me to get the chair, but maybe I can convince him, change his perception. And so he goes, the chair was too far away. So all I did is just like slam the door and jiggle and, and, and put my knee up against it. All right, the chair's there. You're here all day. He goes, I never even went and got the chair. I had to go to a meeting. <laughs> he goes, but the most crazy, fascinating thing happened. He stayed in the closet all day. The door was unlocked. He could have walked out whenever he wanted. But after a little bit of resistance and being told a not truth that you were locked in, he gave up trying and was convinced his new reality was his reality when in reality, all he had to do was this. The story gets even funnier because later that afternoon, the same pastor was doing marriage counseling in his office and that pastor had crawled up through the ceiling and almost fell through the ceiling into his office trying to get out and he had to help him out. Why do I tell that story? Because it's, again, it's such a good picture of what our thoughts do to us. 
is if you think you've been tracked and you, trapped and you believe that there's a lock on the door, but it's not locked, it's not the door that's the problem, it's the lie that's the problem. If you have, thank you, because that's really good. If there's, a, if there's a scenario or there's a movie or a history that plays in your life that somehow defined or meant something when you were five, seven, 17, 27, a divorce, an abuse, a breakup, or you pick one, a bankruptcy, a blown plan, all of a sudden, now it's not about the reality that you currently live. It's that you're convinced that it's still the way it was when you could have walked out a long time ago. And that's what God has for us. That's why he says, like, it's for freedom. I've set you free. He wants you to be free. He came to liberate us. But that's why our perception matters because our perception is our reality. And then here's, the, here's why this matters so much. Then it's actually the lie and not anything else that's holding us back. What if, what if the thing holding you back isn't your, your family of origin or isn't the fact that you got fired or isn't the fact that you didn't get, what if the thing holding you back is a lie? And all you have to do is figure out what to do with that lie. And all of a sudden we have a very different experience. We have the best year ever. We have our best year spiritually. We get in the word. Why? Because we're starting to, 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 to play the game that's happening up here in our minds. And so what do you do? We have to acknowledge, we have to recognize the lie and remove it. And then we have to replace it with truth, which by the way, that's all of what next week is about. And I'm just going to say this. I don't say this every week. I rarely ever say this, but I just think you can't afford to miss a week in January here. The stuff we're going to give you is going to be so good. It could literally change your life forever and set some of you free from decades of, of slavery, decades of being bound by stuff. And I just want that for you so bad. So I would just encourage you got five, you got literally five choices every weekend or it's online. So I'm just saying, I don't think you can afford not to put this into your life. And it's not because, not because I'm like, oh, I'm that good. This is that important. And the word of God is that clear. And we got some really strong stuff coming. And so let me say this. So we have to start doing some work up here in our minds. And I'll say this right up front because I'm going to be fair and, and honest. The struggle of that and the process of that is real. The struggle of it and the process of what I'm talking about is hard. I'm, this is not come up to the front at the end. I'm going to go say some magic prayer. Gold dust is going to fall from heaven and you're magically transformed. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm just saying most of the time it doesn't happen. Especially with this stuff. You can make strides, but this is going to take some work where you go into your own prayer time. You open the word of God. You interact. Remember, what does it say? What does it say to me? What do I want to say to it? How am I going to, we, all the stuff we talked about last week. And then you start to acknowledge this. And what's going to happen is you're going to see transformation and freedom. Depression is going to start to turn to joy. Uh, hopelessness is going to start to turn to hope. Uh, anger is going to start to turn towards like niceness. I, I guarantee you if you'll do the work, but I, I'm not going to be one of those pastors like, you got it. I mean, you do got it. It's stinking hard. Hardest work I've ever done in my life. And I've done some kind of hard things. The, the, the mental and emotional work I've had to do, because this is, this is the thing that I changed. When I said last week, no, no, nothing has impacted my life more than the Bible. It was the Bible in addition to what we're talking about the next four weeks, which is really wrestling with some really hard things that I didn't know were true about myself or that I didn't know I believed about myself or whatever the case may be. And, and so we have to be willing to, be, to do the work and which for some of us might even start to expose some of the lies, like a little bit of a defeated, oh, I can't, I can't do anything hard. No, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You're right, you can't, but the Jesus in you can and he will empower you and he will give you the strength and you can't afford not to because you don't got to stay here. So here's all I want you to take away from this week. Your mind is the battlefield. Your mind is about, it's, there is, I hate to use the word game because our, our series is called Mind Games, but there's literally a battlefield. There's literally something going on all the time and it is, and it is one or lost in your mind. And here's why this matters so much. Because you cannot change what you do not confront. And some of us, best year ever, best year spiritually, freedom and hope, we are gonna have to confront some, I'm gonna use the word demons. I don't actually mean real demons, but I think a powerful lie that has, has held you down for 20, 30, 40 years, 20, 30, 40 minutes is as powerful as a demon in your life because it oppresses you, it keeps you back, it keeps you down. And some of you, God and you, wants you to be so free and so healed and so uh, uh, experience so much more of him. I want that for you. You actually, I don't wanna say you deserve it, but you deserve it. Like that's what God wants for you. But here's why this matters. Some of you are, some of you are like, okay, I, I'm looking at your face. Some of you are like, I know you're talking to me, pastor. I know it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit, by the way. Some of you are like, oh, like, I don't know if I want to do this. I just want to give you fair warning. The battle's going to happen whether you fight or not. You ever been in a wrestling match and decide you were done wrestling and the other guy wasn't or the other girl wasn't? <laughs> ever been in a fight and get tired and be like, okay, I'm ready for this to be over and the other person is still swinging? So you can not want to play 
You can not want to fight, but the battle's going to happen either way. So what happens when you don't play? What happens when you don't fight? You lose. And some of you, I think the, the, the power and the strength that the Holy Spirit wants to give you is just to give you the strength. You go, let's get back in the game. Let's, let's fight this thing. Let's do it. You can't, but we can. I'm going to empower you, but not by might, not by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We can do this. Some of you, this is what you have been waiting for for far too long. Paul says this, Ephesians chapter six, verse 12. He says, our struggle, <laughs> again, wow, crazy ancient book, just knock, knocking it out of the park. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. What does that mean? Your boss isn't your problem. Your ex-spouse isn't your problem. Your neighbor isn't your problem. Now, it may feel like it and they may be in, but, but Paul's saying that's not the real problem, but it's actually against the rulers and against the authorities. And he goes on, he says, against the powers of the dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He's saying we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities. There is a spiritual battle going on all the time. And guess what? It's not happening in the mythical creatures. In the, it's happening right here in the 12 inches, eight inches, six inches between your ears. And that, those thoughts, where all those lies are coming. Are you going to grab them? Are you going to believe them? Are you going to live like they're true? Are you going to walk them out? That's what's going to determine whether we turn them into actions and experiences or not. Because see, the greatest, I believe one of the greatest dr tricks the devil ever pulled was just trying to convince the world he doesn't exist. They're like, oh, the devil's not real. That's no big deal. He does, ah, he's too busy. He doesn't care about you. No, no, no. You know what the Bible says in John 10? He wants to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. You know what it says in Thessalonians 2? That he wants to stop you. Do you know what it says in Peter 5? He wants to devour you. The devil has, the devil has plans for you and none of them are good. And he's always at war. He's always at war. So again, this is happening in our mind. This is not to scare us, but for some of us, we got to take this seriously. So his mission is steal, kill, destroy, devour, stop. How does he do it? Well, he brings the rain fire from, no, from Mordor. No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> I'm going to expose his plan right here. This is his film session for the game Saturday. He lies to you. That's it. He lies. It's all he knows how to do. He just plants thoughts, plants thoughts, and we can't win for even winning. I'm going to give you this for a second, but I want you to see the words of Jesus. Jesus says this about the devil. John chapter eight, verse 44. This is what Jesus had to say. He says, for there is no truth. Somebody say no truth. In him, when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. All he ever knows how to do is lie. Well, who's he lying to? You and me. And here's what's crazy. Even when you do good, he lies to you. Even when you're winning, he's lying to you. Because if you succeed, he'll convince you, you don't need God, you got this. If you fail, he'll try to make you feel like a failure and that God doesn't care about you and that you're no good for nothing. If you have a great first date, he's gonna lie to you and say, romance is the thing that you've always been looking for and the only thing that'll make you happy. You have a terrible first date, no one's ever gonna love you for who you are and it's not even worth it. You stay away from something immoral, well, he's gonna tell you that you're missing out and everybody else is having more fun and it's not that big of a deal anyway. You give in, now the shame comes and he makes you feel like the most worthless piece of crap on the planet that you would ever do such a disgusting thing. So it doesn't matter. You do the wrong thing, he lies, you're the worst. You do the right thing, he's like, you don't need God. You got this. You can't even win for winning. Why? Lies, 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 lies. And that, those lies turn into actions and turn into experience. And we get into this cycle. And here's why the lies matter. Because a lie believed as truth will affect your life as though it were true. Truth. You are a son or a daughter of the most high. If we had an inkling of what that actually meant, I think many of us would live very different lives. That's the truth. You are dearly loved. It's not even close. It's unbelievable. The grace and mercy and good plans that God has for you. I don't even have time to get into it, but it's the best story and the best news ever. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Because if you don't believe that, if there's a lie that's in there based on some experience or something that somebody did to you or said to you, a lie believed as truth will affect your life as though it were true. So you could have unbelievable value. You could be forgiven. Some of you are like, I've made so many mistakes. I could never be anything good. God could never love me. I couldn't even be. No, no, no. That's all lies. But if you believe it is true, it's going to play out as though it's true in your life. Like, for example, a long time ago, we were told the world is flat, right? <laughs> There's still some people who believe that. I'm like, oh, not a great time in history to be believing that now. <laughs> but what happened early on when we were told the world's flat? We wouldn't venture out very far into the oceans. Why? We didn't want to fall off into the abyss. Okay, what happened? Well, we missed out on some adventures. I'm going to tell you another lie. Some of you might not like this. So our parents told us that we need to wait 30 or 60 minutes to swim after we ate. So <laughs> can I tell you that that's a lie? You know what food becomes? Energy. You know what happens when you swim? You burn off energy. 
You've not, if, if, if it's not true with swimming, why isn't it true with like anything other than laying down and taking a nap? It's not true. Go look it up. Some of you are mad. You can go look it up. It's not true. <laughs> so what happens? A lie, believe it though, is true. We missed out on some of us. We missed out on 30 to 60 good minutes of swim time, dang it. <laughs> but what if the lie isn't the world is flat or it's not that we have to wait an hour to go swimming? What if it's that you're not good enough? How will that play out? What will you miss out on on that one? What if it's that you're not actually lovable? How will it play out on that? What if it's that you're never gonna be able to get out of this addictive habit? Then you just quit and you give in and you destroy yourself. What if it's that you've made too many mistakes to be loved or used by God? What if it's that God doesn't care about you? Now all of a sudden, a lie believed is true is gonna have us miss out on a lot more important things than just a little bit of swim time or possibly taking a cruise somewhere to the Bahamas. See, I, this, is, this is so real to my story and I, I'm not gonna get into me, but for me, I have, I have lots of these. Uh, growing up, I was so puny and undersized. I really didn't get picked for any teams, but I got picked on all the time. So I felt like I was defective for a lot of my upbringing. I felt defective. Because of that, girls were never interested in me. I was cute in a little brother sense, never in like a, hey, let's go out sense. So I felt lame and unlovable. I put, because of that, I tried to make up for it in other ways. I put a lot of pressure on myself to be perfect and accomplish, but I always fell short in some, and by some standard, so I never felt good enough. Well, none of those things were actually true, but they were lives that were believed as true, and so they played out in my life. And it wasn't until uh, I really started to do the hard work of this as I became a young adult where God started to reveal that I'm not who others say I am and I'm not who others treat I am. And so I did this hard work. Well, God, who do you say that I am? And what's my value in you? There's an incredible story about this that, that captures this idea of how a lie believed as truth can absolutely change. And so what if, my question is this, what if you were one truth away from changing the course of your life forever like this guy was? Well, my dad had gone to a Toastmasters early on and heard one of the most successful magazine entrepreneurs in the world speak. He comes back and tells me, I just had a chance to hear one of the most successful magazine entrepreneurs in the world speak. And he said, when are you taking your SAT? I said, I'm taking it next year. He said, well, this guy was failing out of high school. He was struggling. He was raised by a single mom in the Midwest, but he promised his mother he would take a test called the SAT. So he takes the SAT in May, his junior year, doesn't expect anything, gets his score back in June. Now the SAT, which I don't know how many your population know, but it's, it's a standardized test with a math part and a verbal part. Both are scored out of 800 points. Well, this guy takes it, he's, he's bombing, he's failing out of school, he doesn't expect anything as he's telling the story at Toastmasters. Well, he gets a 1480 out of 1600. So he's stunned, right? That would be for the smart That's people that listen to your podcast. insane, yeah. Right, cognitive dissonance, right? I got a like, 900 on my SATs just right. to give people a frame. Right, and I got a, a 1090, excuse me. And I got a 1010, right? I was just, hey, four digits, <laughs> it was a miracle, right? And, and, but it's a hard test, and it, you, you know, it's a variety of different things. So he gets the score, and his mother, doing what any mother would do knowing her kids, says, did you cheat? Right? She knows her son, and he says, I swear to God, I tried to cheat, but the way the numbers were and the scantrons and the bubbles, you couldn't cheat. So she says, you mean to tell me you really got that score? He said, yeah, I got the score. So he's stunned, Tom. So as my dad's telling me the story, I'm like, okay. So he says, all right, so what he decides is because he realizes he's smart and he's going into his senior year, he says, I'm gonna go to class. Now he starts to go to class, he doesn't hang out with who he did when he didn't go to class, all right? Teachers see him in class and they said, hey, maybe Franklin Pierce, maybe we missed the boat on this kid. So they start to treat him differently. Well, as the guy would tell the story, he graduates, goes to a community college, goes on to Wichita State, goes on to the Ivy League, and becomes this massively successful magazine entrepreneur. So I said, okay, well, the guy was always smart. He just needed a standardized test to unlock it. My dad said, no, that's not the story. And this is what I want you to understand. He said, 12 years after all this guy's success, he gets a letter in the mail from Princeton, New Jersey doesn't think anything about it. The next day, his wife says, you're gonna open it. He opens it. True story, turns out the SAT board will periodically review their test-taking procedures and the policies. The year he took the test, he was one of 13 people sent the wrong SAT score. His actual score was a 740 out of 1600. <laughs> and he said, people think my whole life changed when I got the 1480. But what happened, my whole life changed when I started acting like a 1480. And what does a 1480 do? He goes to class. One thought, one lie, one truth. How many of us have 1480 value but we're living 740 lives? Test scores don't determine your intelligence, your 
effort and your work ethic does. What somebody else who doesn't really know your value has said to you or how they treated you in the past doesn't dictate your value. The creator dictates your value. And your creator says that you are worth dying for. You're dearly loved in spite of all of your flaws. He dances over you. He laughs when you, when you, when you are, are quirky and all the stuff you got picked on and made fun of are his favorite parts about you. That pain from your past didn't come from him. What if starting this year, we could trade our 740 life and start living the, the 1480 value that God has for us based on the fact that we're gonna exchange some lies for some truth. So what are we gonna do? What's the takeaway? Well, it starts with, as I mentioned, this Tuesday, you all got it. The 21 days of prayer with a real emphasis, spending time in the word. Go through it. it the, the soap journal, it's all there. We're gonna, but here's what I would say. This is what would be your homework, your assignment this week is to do a thought audit. I've said it a couple times this, this sermon. Start to think about or pay attention to what you think about. Get a journal, get a notes app, get a voice memo. When the thoughts jump into your head, whether it's you make a mistake at work or somebody upsets you or you feel something, just start paying attention and do a thought audit. And if you do, what were you gonna find? And, and here, let me just give you a couple questions. I don't know if we have them on the screen, but let me give you questions that would be really, really good for you to start with. What negative messages did you take away from your childhood? That's where any good pastor and any good psychologist is probably gonna start with. I, I had a bunch of, I only gave you like three. I had like 20 of them. They all stem from the same stuff, but it wasn't the surface, it was the root of it. What unhealthy and destructive conclusions have you come to believe about yourself in this place in the world? Do a thought audit. Have you ever caught yourself thinking like, I can't change, it doesn't matter how hard I try. I'll never get out of debt, we just keep in this cycle. No one really loves me. And if they get to see me for who I am, they'll reject me too. I'm not good at relationships. I'm just going to mess it up. I'm always going to struggle with my weight. I'm never going to like the way I look. It's in my family. I can't get close to God. I'm sure it's my fault. What are the thought audits that have you, because your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Some of us, maybe it's when I look at what other people's posts on social media, I feel like my life is lame and it sucks. Whatever it is. What would happen if we start paying attention to what's going on? Perhaps if we're looking for a completely different experience, we can work backwards and go, I gotta have better actions, but it's gotta start by paying attention to what's going on in my mind. What if we started to think about what we actually think about?
begins here singing you make all things new and you make all things new and i will follow you How many of you feel this in your heart? You feel this in your soul? Like this is the most important thing we could be doing with our lives in the beginning of a year. That song is, is, is beautiful because it's talking about everything we're talking about, but there's a, that, that prayer at the end is, is based in, in scripture. It says, when I surrender my Christ, he makes all things new. It doesn't mean it magically changes, but his spirit comes in and he gives you the power and the strength to take thoughts and lies captive and stop leaving a lie as if it were true and you actually replace it with truth. Some of us, we've been trying so hard with our actions and our experience. And your first step is you just gotta surrender to Christ. Like it's that simple. I don't know how to make it any more clear. You just, this is, there's no better time than right now to say, Jesus, I'm done trying. You be the one to do it. I need truth. I, my life is moving in the direction of my strongest thoughts and I need you. We're not gonna chase another experience. We're not even gonna chase a moment. Try harder on actions. It starts with our mind. And so maybe you know what it is right now. I just, I'm gonna just take a minute and say a prayer and, and I wanna invite you just, God, like start to break the lies and, and, and there's gonna be power in you saying that yourself. When I pray, God, break the lies in my life, expose the lies in my life because there is a battle going on and it is happening in your mind and you can either fight and it is a fight, but you will win because greater is he who is in us than he that's in the world or you will lose. And some of you, you like God is tired of, of watching you lose and he's like, I'm coming to rescue you. Just let me in and let's do this. And so I'm gonna say a prayer. And some of you just need to say, yeah, you need to literally surrender your mind and your life to Christ. If you do that, we wanna walk with you. We're gonna help you. The rest of us, this is why we have this. We, we started working on this three months, two months ago. What do we need to put in it this year? We, we're literally putting scripture in front of you and giving you a journal to go carve out your 10 or 15 minutes. And so the best thing you can do, I'm happy to pray with you. We have a prayer team in the prayer room. We have an online prayer room. But the, the best thing you can do for yourself, in, in addition to or even instead of that, is you go dig into this yourself and you allow the word to start to transform your mind. And some of you, this is gonna be a brand new journey for you. You're just starting and it's awesome. For some of you, you've been in church your whole life and you still can't afford not to do this. You still hate yourself. You still holding yourself prisoner for past mistakes. Still compare yourself. There's so much freedom. There's so much freedom. There's so much freedom available to us. If we will just take a step towards God, he will meet us right where we're at. He's the best at it. So as I pray, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, it's a simple saying, Jesus, I'm putting my life in your hands. I want you to say that. And then after you do, I want you to send us that text message because we want to help you and empower you. And then for the rest of us, we don't have to wait till the 11th on Tuesday. Let's start digging into our word. A couple scriptures. I gave you the template last year, last week. It's pretty much the same thing as this. The scripture, the observation, application, prayer. But it's not, it can't be a thing to do. It's gotta be an interaction with the living word and the Holy Spirit. 
I can't tell you how bad I want this for you and how bad I sense this is what God has for us. So I can only imagine what he's about to do in your life if you give him the littlest room in your heart and in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your truth. I thank you that you love to expose the enemy, God. And, and while there may be some, we some weariness, there may be some fear, there may be some weight to this, God, that we are promised that, 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 uh, that the devil is nothing in compared to you. It's not a rivalry. You, you conquered him. You, it's, it, it's, it doesn't even pale in comparison, the power that, that, that you have over him. And so for God, I love the promise that when we give ourselves to you, when we submit ourselves to you, that you literally come in us and you make all things new. We're not going back. And so God, for every single one of us here who is who's saying, I need to submit, submit my life to Christ. God, would you come in? Would you transform our hearts and our minds? And would you empower us by your Holy Spirit to take thoughts captive? And then God, for the rest of us, as we dig into your word, whether it's this journal or something else, would you make your word come alive? Would you, would you allow us to experience your freedom and wholeness and healing and truth like never before? God, may we see uh, uh, just a, a, a growth and may we see you uh, begin to move in the areas that we need you the most. God, I, I just pray, God, that you would uh, remind us, bug us, inspire us to get up, to get in our word and make it come alive and make it make sense like never before. And God, we thank you that you are never done with us, that you are never uh, uh, fed up with us, that you are never impatient with us and that you're always ready to meet us right where we're at. So God, I pray that as we go here, we encounter you not just in the service, but every time we crack open your word in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Corey. What a great reminder that a lie believed as truth will affect your life as though it were true. And that this year, church, we need to be on purpose and think about what we think about. Today, if you decided to take that first step and give your life to Christ, I wanna be the first to say congratulations. As you continue to grow in your faith and become who God has created you to be, we want you to know that we're so excited to be a part of your journey. Today, if you committed your life to Christ, we would like to send you a short video each day this next week. Now these short videos are awesome resources as you continue to walk out that first week. Living for Christ is the greatest adventure of your life and I'm so excited for what's in store. To receive these videos, just click the connect link that appears after you click the link in the chat saying that you'd like to commit your life to Christ or simply text Cape Yes to 94,000. Congratulations again, this truly is a special day. Now the chat's gonna remain open for the next few minutes. If you'd like someone to pray with you, you can always click that live prayer button and one of our hosts will join you. And if you haven't downloaded the Cape Christian app yet, it's the best way to connect with us during the week and get plugged into everything that's going on here at Cape Christian. Thanks again, church. And we will see you next week for week two of our series, Mind Games.